Do you see the slide? Yes. Also, has recording been restarted? Um, yeah, I, I just started it. Care of that. Yeah. Okay, so Nicholas, uh, thanks for um, accepting our invitation to give okay. a talk and uh, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm really uh, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about modular bosonic subsystem codes. Um, before we get started, one tradition that we have in Australia is to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who uh, have been here for sometimes something around 60,000 years. So uh, 60,000 years indigenous Australians have, have, have been on this land. And so uh, the particular place that I'm at, um, based on that location, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and the Bunurong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to their ancestors and elders past and present. This is just a way of uh, uh, acknowledging uh, those, those peoples. This is the uh, Aboriginal flag uh, of Australia, and this is the um, flag of the Torres Strait Islander peoples. And these are actually official flags of Australia, as well as uh, this, this, this bad boy back here, which I've got. Anyway, okay, so um, let's continue. So I'm part of an ARC Center of Excellence. Uh, that's the Australian Research Council. Center of Excellence, and it's the Center for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology. So these slides will be available later, and uh, you can you can have a look. Uh, but uh, in brief, uh, CQC2T is working to create universal quantum computer and secure communication systems. We've got over 200 researchers across seven Australian universities. They're all down here. We have 25 in uh, 25 formal international partners, and 22 coordinated research programs. Um, so it's a pretty big effort. Uh, my group at uh, RMIT, uh, we call it Kermit, it's pronounced Kermit. Um, QU is alluding to quantum, of course, but um, if you want to check us out, uh, feel free to go there. We do, we do more than just quantum computing. We also, we also do some fundamental physics work. So I'd like to start by, oh, before I continue, so are we going to go based on a 40-minute talk, or is that, is that right, Barbara? Um. Is this 40? Yeah, well, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 40 minute talk. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So it's 55, so 35. All right. So um, continuous variable quantum computing. So let's start with this. So with computation of any sort, we have an input and we have an output. And in between, we do something. So with qubits, you start in the block sphere, you unitarily evolve it to some other state. Well, the equivalent, the, the, when we say continuous variable quantum computing, what we mean is you take a wave function and you controlledly evolve it to a new wave function. And, and as long as you can do that with any wave function, with some caveats, uh, with, with, as long as you can implement any unitary evolution on multiple modes, uh, you can, that we call that quantum computing with continuous variables. So in this case, it's just been displaced as a wave function here. So, okay, fine, but why bother with continuous variables? What is, what is the point of doing this? Well, and uh, most of what I'm gonna say here is, is focused on the optical uh, regime, which is where I have the most experience, but, um, uh, but, but a lot of this, well, some of this, not a lot of it, but some of it will also apply to circuit QED. Um, so at the practical level, uh, we can get deterministic entanglement from these sources. And that's always been a problem optically. It's getting, getting the photons to talk to each other in a deterministic manner is, is quite difficult. There's huge scaling potential for these entangled states. So this is uh, uh, something I talk about in, in my other work with continuous variable cluster states. That's in the optical domain. In circuit QED, however, a lot of the emphasis has, has come about because as I understand it, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the microwave cavities are, are actually less noisy than the transmons themselves. So if you, if you use the transmon as an ancilla rather than as the data carrier, uh, you can actually, um, you can actually do, do better in some cases. At a fundamental level, of course, we, we have the mode, we have the full mode. We don't need to restrict to a photonic qubit. So this avoids premature optimization. From the CV perspective, the photonic qubit is just some particular wave function choice. So we, we choose the, the ground state to be the, uh, uh, well, you know, there's two modes, but let's just say you choose the, the, the zero photon state vacuum to be your zero and the one photon wave function to be one. Well, why bother with that? There's, there's good reasons to do it experimentally, but from a theoretical point of view, there is no need to do that. And both, both together, there's more options for practical tasks. 
quantum cryptography has been well developed in the CV domain. Um, and uh, cluster states is another thing that, that I've done a lot of work on. And of course, there's hybrid schemes. So continuous variable technology can help to manipulate photonic quantum states. But of course, there's a bunch of disadvantages as well. So at the practical level, there are imperfections due to finite energy. And uh, I'll be talking about that uh, quite a bit. And we eventually, this is the real, the real kicker, we eventually will need to discretize for error correction. Um, it's just like you, you can't perfectly maintain an analog signal, even classically. Um, there's always, when you, when you process it or copy it or do anything to it, you're going to have some degradation. So you have to, you have to discretize it at, at some level uh, to, to use it. And the same is true quantum mechanically. At the fundamental level, of course, there are more questions to answer. For instance, what discretization do you use? That's a very important question. And we have to incorporate the effects of noise from day one because of these, these issues. Now, not every CV code has these issues, but a lot of them do. And so this is complicated and it's easy to end up writing a crap paper if you're not careful. Uh, both together, we have to do extra work to employ existing algorithms because these are based on qubits. And it's a smaller literature. There's fewer optimized experimental platforms. Uh, and so in, in, in some ways we're ahead, but in some ways we're always playing catch up with the, with the qubit literature. All right, so let's, let's talk about fault tolerance. I mentioned that you need to discretize for error correction and the point of error correction is eventually to be tolerant of faults. So in 2001, there's this now famous paper encoding a qubit in an oscillator by Gottes Nikotayev and Preskill. And um, there, there have been, a, uh, there have been, there was at least one talk about this. Um, it was uh, Krishna's talk, uh, what was it, yesterday for you guys? Is that right? Yeah, I guess it's the morning over there. So yesterday for you guys. Um, I watched it this morning uh, after I got up. And uh, so Krishna introduced these states, but I'm going to reintroduce them pictorially uh, for those who didn't see the talk. So the goddess of Kitai Preskill encoding, this is an approximate GKP state, GKP. Um, this is an approximate GKP state. The blue part is the logical zero, and the red part is the logical one. And this state, uh, so, okay, so it's, it's approximate because in the ideal case that they had in mind, these spikes would be infinitely thin, infinitesimal in their width, infinitely high, so they'd be delta functions, and there would be an infinite number of them. Uh, all, all the blue ones should be at the same height. The, physical, the physicality, the re requirement for finite energy and physicality, normalizability, all those things uh, mean that, that a fiducial way of representing approximate versions of these states is to use a collection of Gaussian pulses uh, with an overall Gaussian envelope, overall Gaussian envelope. Anyway, by the way, this is a wave function. Um, so maybe, maybe some of you have seen this in the Wigner function picture. I'll show some of those later. Uh, but this is a wave function for a particular mode of light. So this, here's an example of what kind of noise these things suffer. So this is an introduction for people who haven't seen this before, uh, GKP before, but, it, but basically you, you've got a qubit that's encoded like this. So this state, because the even spikes, so the, the, the ones at even um, grid points here are a bit higher than the odd spikes, then we say that this is some uh, unequal superposition of logical zero and logical one. But over time, uh, this is in a CV cluster state as the information gets processed, but really this would happen with any system. There would be some sort of noise and a canonical type of noise would be, you, you end up blurring in position here and then maybe the envelope shrinks a bit. That, the shrinking of the envelope is equivalent to blurring in momentum. So these are two types of errors. Um, that, that in this particular case occurs separately. But what I want you to get out of this is that the, the state degrades. And by the time we're at step nine here, you can see that the spikiness is really gone. We really have a narrow envelope and the, 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 the quality of the state is highly degraded. It, it's unlikely that if you use this in an experiment compared to this, um, that it would be useful. This is quite a noisy state. Okay, so what can we do about that? Of course, we measure stabilizers and we correct. So the basic circuit in the GKP paper um, looks like this, slightly modified version of this, but as long as you have a collection of these logical zero states, which I showed earlier, then you can entangle them with your data, measure in some, do some homodyne measurement, get an outcome. And uh, homodyne measurements are generally easy in optics. I realize it's different in circuit QED, 
Um, but, but in optics, you can directly measure one of the two quadratures or really any quadrature that you want, any combination of, of um, position and momentum, and you get some outcome. And this outcome tells you, not exactly, but it gives you some information of how far off grid this state is. So what's happened here is that this sort of crappy state has had its spikiness restored. As you can see, these spikes are better quality than these spikes. They're narrower on the, on the right than they are on the left. But the price you pay for that is it's a bit off grid. And because it's a bit off grid, then what you do is you have to make a choice as to whether, whether to displace to the left, in which in this particular case, that recovers the state. You don't know that, but you have to make a guess. Or you displace to the right, in which case you have a qubit level error that you don't know about. OK, that's fine. We know how to handle qubit level errors. We use uh, qubit error correction. So that's well established. And we, we know that if, there's, if, if these states are the initial states, like the, the, the blue ones over here, are high quality enough, and these are low noise enough, then this should all work for fault tolerance. OK, this is not a talk about GKP. But I'm going to, I'm using GKP to illustrate uh, uh, the, the, the basics of discrete encoded information in CD systems. Why am I using GKP? Well, that's a very good question. There's any number of reasons why. Uh, there are several reasons one might give, but um, I, will, I will give it based on this. So this slide is actually out of date. And it's out of date uh, in, in this particular square. So I want to focus on this. I will get to the rest of it in a moment. I realize there's a lot here. Don't focus on any of the rest of it. Just focus on this square. So this is the GKP encoding. And the question is, how do you do a single system non-Clifford operation? In the original proposal by GKP, this required some additional non-Gaussian resource. Now keep in mind that the GKP Pauli eigenstates themselves are already highly non-Gaussian. But it was proposed by Gottesman, Kataev, and Preskill, that you needed an additional non-Gaussian resource beyond just those Pali eigenstates. Um, so you needed, for instance, a cubic phase gate or a cubic phase state um, to do the gate. Uh, I, I would encourage you to um, uh, perhaps rethink that choice. Uh, keep an eye on the archive in the next few weeks. But um, the, the, the real game changer was this paper. So um, this, this came out of my group, published in PRL. Um, by a bunch of us, and we, we showed that you don't actually need an additional non-Gaussian element. The non-Gaussianity in the logical zero state suffices on its own with non-deterministic Gaussian operations to give you a logical magic state. Now, that was the innovation of this paper. And that means that this box should really also be Gaussian operations. Now, for those of you not familiar with optics, Gaussian operations are generally considered easy or easier than non-Gaussian ones. So this was a big breakthrough. Now, remember what I said earlier was that, that the resource here was the logical zero state, the Pauli eigenstate. And that's good for error correction. It turns out it's enough as long as you have Gaussian operations. Another way to look at this paper is actually that the vacuum is a magic state. It has the non-Cliffordness that's required for the GKP encoding. You can look at it either way. Either the zero state has the non-Gaussianity or the vacuum has the non-Cliffordness, non-Pauli eigenstateness for GKP. It's kind of cool. But um, then this year, and this actually answers one of the questions that was asked during Krishna's talk. So the question was, why are you targeting the zero, logical zero state as opposed to a logical Hadamard eigenstate? What this paper shows is that if you tr target instead the logical Hadamard eigenstate, then you can deterministically make the logical zero with Gaussian operations. So this was a nice um, cost reduce, they call it. So it's no longer non-deterministic, it's all deterministic. Anyway, this is a slight digression, but I think it's really important for, for showing why I'm spending so much airtime with uh, GKP. Okay, so this is the new um, grid here. So photonic qubits are, uh, you have a single photon in two modes. GKP qubits uh, in their canonical form are our single mode, and then there's the general CV sense in which we have these things. So let's, let's have a look. So one system Clifford operations, let's do photonic qubits first. One system Clifford operations are, uh, you, you can rotate, in fact, you can rotate in however you want in the block sphere with just beam slitters and phase delays if you have a photonic qubit. So that, that's, that's an advantage, um, passive operations, that's a subset of Gaussian. 
The two system Clifford is very difficult though. That's where you have to post select or you have to do something much, much harder. This is the one that is, that is non-deterministic. The preparation, you have ways of preparing them, but um, as anyone who has worked at PsyQuantum or, or has talked to them knows, this is, this is where these two things are where a lot of the, the, the trouble lies. And measurement is you only need to distinguish vacuum from non-vacuum. So this is actually quite, quite nice. Um, GKP has pluses and minuses. So now all of, the, all of the gates are Gaussian if you have the GKP states. Unfortunately, the GKP states are very hard to make in optics, although they've made in other platforms, then made in other platforms. Measurement is done with homodyne. So this is really nice because once you have the GKP states, you don't need photon counting anymore. That's actually really important. You can do everything with Gaussian operations once you have this. So we've reduced the hard part to just making good quality states. And that's the big advantage. In practice, you may want to make both the Pali zero, the Pali eigenstate and the Hadamard eigenstate. Sure, but if you have either one, you can get the other one with just Gaussian. In the, the, the general CV analog of these is that Gaussian operations are the CV equivalent of Clifford's and non-Gaussian operations give you non-Clifford's and then these are more generic. Okay. Um, just some brief results. In nature, uh, last year, there was a demonstration in trapped ions of these GKP qubits. Here are the Wigner functions that some of you may have seen. And here are the uh, probability distributions for them. So this was demonstrated. And it was also demonstrated in superconducting qubits. I don't, I don't know if this has been published yet. It wasn't published as of a month ago. But I didn't check more recently. So it's been demonstrated in circuit QVD as well. It has not yet been demonstrated in optics, although there are proposals. So this is what I really want to talk about, GKP issues, you have issues with GKP. So what I mean by this is let's go back to the original, the original one that I talked about. I said this is a decent quality state. One can argue about whether it is or not, but that's what we're looking at. So let's zoom in on that. The conceptual issues all boil down to the definition of GKP actually differs from its use in a laboratory. So the ideal GKP logical subspace is entirely unphysical. It requires infinite energy to make these states. So the definition already says that the states would require delta functions on, on, at these intervals and an infinite number of them. So that's not physical. So you're already never going to make a, a perfect state. Even if you have perfect experimental equipment, you will never make a perfect GKP state. All right, that's not a fundamental problem, but it's kind of annoying. And as a theorist, it's very annoying because you know, we, 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 when you work with qubits, you can imagine at least a perfect qubit, even if you'll never make one experimentally. But here, you, can, you can't really use it at all. You can't even, you can't even imagine that that could be a possibility. Um, the other problem, at least in optics, is that we bin measurements of Q or P to get the qubit level Z or X outcomes. So the way this works is to see whether this, to do a measurement of logical Z, you just measure in the Q quadrature here. And if you get an outcome that is closer to an even multiple of root pi than to an odd multiple of root pi, then you say, I have a logical zero. If you get one that's closer to the odd, then you say, I have a logical one. Point being, you don't have to be right at this location. You can tolerate a little bit of deviation. And we just put bins on there to take care of that. That's the second difference. So that's not, I mean, it, the paper talks about this, of course, but um, it's not part of the definition of what the logical qubit is. Here's another problem. Large displacements by what should be stabilizers of the ideal code give an orthogonal state to a physical implementation of that code. I mean, that's conceptually very problematic because you take this state, hopefully you're looking at me, you take this state, and you shift it by what should be the identity and suddenly you have zero overlap with your original state and you're saying, oh, well, well that could be a problem, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. And, and, and at, a, at a more, I don't know, I, I, I really like to have a quantitative notion of how the particular shape of the wave function is affecting the logical content. I mean, I can say that this is a superposition of zero and one, but it's not really. I mean, look at these spikes, they're all different heights. It's just kind of, it's kind of a mess. Now you can deal with it, but it's kind of annoying to have to be a bit smushy about what, what we're talking about here. So we'd like a code that reflects how these states are actually used in practice. We would like an actual logical qubit, at least in our description. 
and we would like to rigorously capture the parts of the state that don't matter logically. For instance, tiny displacements or an overall large shift phi to some even multiple of root pi. And we would like to account for any logical qubit noise due to the state imperfections. As in, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that if, this, if the, these things blur out too much or the envelope gets too small, you're not going to have the same state that you started with. We saw that from the previous slides. So we would like to account for this uh, at the logical level exactly. GKP do this in terms of an embedded error, but that's just invented and that's just inventing a new object that captures that. It, it doesn't put it into the language that we like, which are quantum channels and logical qubits and decoherence. So it would be nice if we had that. Introduce modular bosonic subsystem code. So this paper uh, was recently published just last month. Uh, in PRL. So this is by uh, two champions, uh, Giacomo Pantaleoni, who is a PhD student working with me at RMIT, and Ben Barajola, who's a postdoc working with me at RMIT. And um, the three of us have uh, looked at this particular fact. If you take the Hilbert space for a continuous variable system, represented here by the real line, and you decide to divide up the projector onto that Hilbert space into a direct sum of two projectors. One of them projects you onto the bins that are centered around even multiples of, in this case, root pi. So alpha in this case is root pi. This is a figure taken from this paper, by the way. Alpha was left general, but in my talk, it's gonna be root pi. So if, if you take the bins from, let's say in this case, minus root pi on two to plus root pi on two, and also all bins uh, that are two root pi away from that, and you collect them all, you just stack them together, you know, pull together the blocks, then you get another copy of the real line, direct summed with another copy of the real line. And by that, I mean projections onto these subspaces. Well, if you have two identical subspaces direct summed, you can rewrite that as a qubit tensor product, one copy of the subspace. And so because of the, the Hilbert hotel -ish, you know, situation here with countable infinities, you can take a countable you can take the integers, divide them up into evens and odds, put them together, and now you have two copies of the integers. And so you just, uh, um, and then within each of those integer bins, you have some particular location that you're at. So that's what we've done here. At the operator level, what we do is we decompose the position operator, which is a plus a dagger uh, on two, root two for those who, who care. Um, and that's going to be root pi times some integer plus the remainder modular. So this is actually one of uh, Harnoff's modular variables. And this is the um, uh, inverse Fourier series of the other one. Wait, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. And then what we do is we further decompose this in. So that was just this step. We're just dividing into bins where we say, which bin am I in and, and that's this, and where am I within the bin? But then we go further and we take the bin number and we take its parity and we say if the bin is even, we say that the qubit is logical zero. We de declare that to be a state with logical zero. And if it's odd, we say it's logical one. And then we take the remainder of that and we stick that into something that we call the gauge mode. And you can reconstruct using this formula, just putting subscript Gs on everything, a gauge Q out of, uh, you know, you can rewrite this in terms of the gauge position. Okay, so that's what we've done. How does this apply to a state that looks like this? Well. Let's just look at these bins. So what we're saying is that these portions of the wave function covered with the, the blue filter here correspond to a new wave function. So we're just gonna take these and go put them together. And when we say that this, what we have is the logical zero tensor, this wave function. And then the rest of it will be logical one tensor, that wave function. And when you do that, what you get is something that looks like this. So quite literally, this wave function in the full mode is equal to, in our subsystem decomposition, zero logical tensor, this wave function in the gauge mode, plus one logical tensor, this wave function in the gauge mode. Now, notice that these do not have the same norm. And so if you were to renormalize them, then you would get coefficients out front. Also, there could be some relative phase between this part and this part, and you could pull that out into relative phase here, and then you'll have a gen, but, but you could do that. But this is a generic version of, uh, this is a generic pure state 
uh, there's a way to write a generic pure state between a qubit and a mode. But notice that because these states are slightly different, um, maybe I didn't emphasize that, but, but they are, even in shape, they're different. Like this one is, has a single peak at the, at, at the top here and it's surrounded by lower peaks. This one doesn't have that. It has two peaks that are similar size. So this is not the same state as this, which means that this is an entangled state. So you've taken a pure state over the single mode and you've rewritten it as entanglement between a logical qubit and a gauge mode. That means that if you ignore the gauge information, that causes decoherence of the logical. That's good because now all the standard tools of quantum information are available for analysis. Of course, the, the caveat here is that tracing out the gauge mode is not quite as simple as it would be if you were just interacting with a bath or you had some loss. It's a non-Markovian model because the gauge mode, the bath, sticks around and reinteracts with the logical state as the total state evolves. So like when you do a FOIA transform, you get an interaction between the gauge mode and the logical qubit again. But nevertheless, at least at the state level, this is, this is interesting and it provides a nice picture. Okay, so let's apply this picture to approximate GKP state. I should say that you can apply the subsystem decomposition to any state at all. This doesn't in principle have anything to do with GKP. This is applicable to any wave function, but I'm gonna focus on GKP because that was the motivation. So this is another figure from our paper. And what I'd like you to look at are, this is, this is a state, this is an approximate GKP state with very well-defined um, spikes, but not infinite, and an extremely large envelope. So in this, in this state, for those who, who know about GKP, the noise in momentum would be far less, would be extremely small, and the noise in Q would be small. For B, the envelope has gotten smaller. So we've gotten a little bit more noise in, in momentum. And here the envelope is much smaller. And here it's so small that it only contains a single peak. So let's look at what that looks like when you do the decomposition and trace out the gauge mode. Now we have a logical block sphere where this is the plus, this is X, and this is Z. So at, for A, we have a very good rendition of the logical plus state. At B, we have a little bit of dephasing. So although we tried to encode plus, the fact that we have an envelope means that we've dephased our information a little bit. As the envelope gets smaller, we actually start moving through the interior of the block sphere. This is closer to a magic state than, than to a plus state. It's closer to you know, a Hadamard eigenstate, um, but it's, it's also impure. It's purity. Here's, here's also the logical fidelity with plus and the purity. So the purity has decreased quite a bit by, by this point. And as you go further, the purity goes back up, but now you're at a totally different state. So despite trying to make the plus, if the envelope is too small, you get back to a zero. Okay, let's distill out some intuition from this. So for high quality states, first of all, dephasing is the dominant logical noise. I'm talking about A versus B. So for very high quality states, and I didn't show this, but if you make these, these um, spikes a little bit wider, you're not gonna see any change here. And that's because we chose to decompose in the position basis. We could have decomposed in the momentum basis instead, and then these two effects would be reversed. But the effects that I'm talking about are the spike size, it's, it's, it's rather insensitive to the size of the spike in position, but it's highly sensitive to the shape, to, to the, the, the size of the envelope. And so you get dephasing before you get, um, uh, well, yeah, dephasing along the other axis. So also notice that a single spike in in uh, position, this zero Q state up here, this one, is a highly pure zero logical state. I mean, that's kind of weird because you'd think like it's not a GKP state, never said it was. Um, actually, that's not true, I did say it was. But what I said was that the subsystem decomposition doesn't care, doesn't require you to use GKP. So the logical content of zero Q is a highly pure zero L. So let's look at these logical equivalences. So there's a table from our paper that looks like this. I'm gonna go through each of them. So this is the first line here. Um, this is the partition part position basis. So this is just the MU basis, but I, you could just skip to over here if you'd like, cause I'm gonna do this bit uh, pictorially. So we're gonna start with a zero Q state. So this is the position wave function, here are the bins, and the delta function at zero is the wave function for this state. Well, this only has overlap with the blue parts. And you can imagine that, it, that, that in the red parts, there's another copy of this delta function multiplied by zero. And so you have a tensor product, which is zero logical tensor 
zero Q in the gauge mode. So this says that the gauge mode now has uh, another position eigenstate in it, and the logical information is zero. The zero P looks like this. So this is the momentum eigenstate with, with eigenvalue zero. It would be approximated by a well squeezed momentum squeeze state. Um, but in this case, we actually have equal, equal overlap with all the bins. But it's not a GKP state because it's not centered at multiples of root pi. So nevertheless, logically, because we have the same thing in the blue as we do in, in all the, the, the pinks, we have a logical plus state. And when you take out either the blues and collapse the pinks or take out all the pinks and collapse the blues, you get the same thing, which is another, uh, another momentum eigenstate in the gauge mode. So this is an equivalence. Let's look at GKP. The zero GKP state only has overlap with the blue parts. So if we get rid of the pink and put it together, we get another GKP state. But this time it's a plus one because we've, we've shrunk it. We've taken these blocks and collapsed them. So it's zero GKP is zero logical tensor plus GKP. Analogously, the one GKP state is one in the logical tensor, the same thing here, which means if you have a superposition of them, if you have an ideological GKP state, then that's just whatever state you've encoded and tensored with plus GKP. Notice that the shape of these wave functions is the same and that the difference in their heights is accounted for by the amplitudes inside. Okay, so what this means is that there's a literal equality here, that if we trace out the gauge mode, the logical information in this state is the same as the logical information in this state. And that's this, just a projector onto logical zero. Furthermore, this also works for the, the, the P eigenstate. If you take the gauge trace, you write it like this, you take the gauge trace of the, the zero momentum state, that's the same as the gauge trace of the plus GKP state. That's just logical plus projector. I'll get to the difference in a moment. You're probably thinking this seems a bit, you know, cheaty, but I'll get to it in a moment. Here's another thing that's really important. Remember how I said that if you, if you shift too far, you have an orthogonal state? Well, let's take a slightly idealized version of this. Here's a, here's a finite superposition of these GKP states. And I should have gotten rid of these little dots. Those don't belong there. But there's a finite superposition. It doesn't go on forever. And so that, that's why it's a tilde, because it's, it's, it, it, it only has um, five units of support. It doesn't go on forever. If you take the gauge trace of that, it's exactly the same as the gauge trace of this shifted state, because the shift is done by an even multiple of root pi. And when you do that, the logical state is approximately, but not exactly, the state you intended to encode. So this, this explains why there is zero overlap between these two states, despite them encoding the same information. Because when you take the fidelity of the total state, you multiply the, the logical fidelity times the gauge fidelity. And the gauge fidelity has gone to zero, but the logical fidelity has not. So logical equivalences. The subsystem decomposition shows logical equivalence of certain GKP and other simpler states. So a single spike in Q, for instance, the, the zero uh, eigenstate of the, the Q operator is a highly pure logical zero state. A single spike in P, which is a superposition of all possible Qs, zero P, is a highly pure zero plus, uh, sorry, plus logical state. So what is going on with the GKP states? Well, they are a gauge fixed version of the logical psi and with a specified gauge mode and the gauge mode needs to be plus GKP. What's going on there? Why did they, I mean, they didn't use this language, but, but why is this so good? Well, it's good, you know, why, why do you need to use this instead of this or this? Why, why can't you just get away with momentum or position eigenstates? Well, the choice of gauge determines the robustness to shift errors. So if your gauge qubit, sorry, your gauge mode is in the zero position eigenstate, it's actually robust to small Q errors, Q shift errors. If you shift the Q a little bit, um, it doesn't change anything. Um, the overall state that is, if you, if you shift it, as long as you don't shift it out of the bin, you're fine. You'll still get the, the right statistics when you measure both X and Z. But uh, the zero, the momentum gauge, uh, sorry, let me try that again. The momentum eigenstate in the gauge mode is robust to small P shift errors. Now the price you pay for this, which I talk about here, is that when you, when you shift in position, there's no change unless you cross a bin line. 
but when you shift in momentum, there is a continuous rotation of the qubit that happens as you displace in momentum. And this is the source, this asymmetry between what happens here and, and here in your displacements is the source of the dephasing because you don't get any noise until, it, until the shift is large when you do it in Q, but you always get a continuous shift when you shift in P. And shifts by stabilizers leave the logical qubit alone. All right, so I'm coming to uh, close to the end. This is the last content piece, and then there'll be this content slide, and then there'll be a conclusion. So CB cluster states and GKP. So continuous variable cluster states look like this. They are made, so they have a graph representation, and they're made by connecting a zero momentum eigenstate. I just want you to focus on A for the moment, because I know there's a lot going on in this slide. This is from our paper as well. Just focus on A for the moment. We have a two-mode state here. So the representation is that this black circle is a zero momentum state. This is at the full mode level. This is CV mode level. Now, what we do is we decompose this visually into three, uh, three subsystems. Now, the gauge mode we've decomposed into a, um, this is essentially a rotor because it's, it's a modular piece. And then this is the um, dual description of a rotor, which is uh, just, just integers. So the Hilbert space for this is just integers. If it's filled in, that means you are superposing all the possible values. So this filled square is a superposition over all, um, over all m values. And this filled circle is a superposition over all uh, modular, displaced, modular uh, position eigenstates. And this is the logical plus state. So this zero momentum state is the su equal superposition of all of these variables. This also is that. When we do the controlled Z gate to connect them, then what happens is you get a, a, a host of, a, of controlled Z-like interactions. And you can see our paper for, for details on this. But this represents the entanglement structure between them. And you can kind of read this as a cluster state graph. So what you have is, if you just ignore all this junk going on down here, you have a logical cluster state, qubit level logical cluster state, that is exactly the same structure as this one. In fact, this generalizes, I'm gonna to move to D now, this generalizes to any graph you want. You get a logical graph that has the same structure, but there's all this hang, hanger on stuff, which are the gauge modes entangled with the neighboring logical qubits. So this is, this is why it's not exactly a logical state. Well, what if you did a GKP cluster state? You, you started with a GKP plus state, which is what this is. You put them through a controlled Z gate, that should be a logical controlled Z, and it is. A GKP state is exactly a logical, GKP plus state is exactly a logical plus uh, empty circle, which is just saying that the, that the modular position is zero, which just means it's always at the center of its bin, and a filled square, which means it's a superposition of all possible bins. So this, when you put it through those controlled Z gates, all those gates happen. They just acted trivially because of, of this thing. So having a circle here, eliminates, I'm going to go to B now, eliminates those lines. When you have a circle, it's an eigenstate of the controlled Z operator, and so all you get is an overall phase. If this were an open circle, you just get this. The final point that I wanted to get, okay, so that, that's this. CV cluster states comprise a logical qubit cluster state entangled with neighboring gauge modes, and each teleportation step measure, measures both L and G, logical and the gauge. So what happens is if you imagine that this is stuck at the end, let's put it over here, and you were to measure momentum here, then we know that from other work that I've done that, that you, you just teleport the state up to a Fourier transform along the line. So you measure momentum at each of these and then the state just hops along. And at the logical level, that would be just the, the, the GKP state getting a Hadamard, another Hadamard, another Hadamard, and, and, and then there's some outcome dependent X gates. I'm just ignoring those for the moment. But what's happening at the decomposed level, at the subsystem level? Well, what's happening down here is that if you have this packed onto the end, then this empty circle being a GKP state has, has deleted all these lines. So the only line that remains is this line between the, the filled square and the next filled circle. And there's an intuition that you can port from cluster states, which is when you measure this in whatever the momentum basis is, is the mutually unbiased basis to whatever this value is, this M, then when you measure it like that, which is what you do when you measure P physically, it teleports this state onto this mode with a Fourier transform. 
Well, the Fourier transform of a filled square is actually an empty circle. And so the empty circle acts like a bomb. It just blows up these connections. They're all gone. And in fact, it blows up this one. So what you have is, is you measure this and this. Uh, this one is irrelevant. This one teleports into here and destroys all these connections. And now you just have the logical measurement that is whatever you would have done if it had just been an all GKP state. So this explains why GKP plays so nicely with CV cluster states. Propagating a GKP state through a CV cluster state disentangles the logical cluster state from the gauge modes as it travels. I like to call this unzipping because it just kind of, you know, it just unzips it tooth by tooth as it goes. Um, so this was, this was described in our paper. Um, Giacomo has another paper coming up that talks about this in, in more detail. So conclusion, um, the GKP, GKP is a useful code, but at least in our opinion, it suffers from some conceptual issues. The subsystem decomposition can be applied to any wave function to give a logical qubit and a gauge mode. It reflects the way GKP is actually used, but it's not limited to GKP, that's this part. There are more possibilities for a logical encoding. Um, we may be able to find simpler ga gates or simpler states that have the same logical information. I mean, there's some, we have to do some checks because these, the gauge modes will leak out and the entanglement will mess things up. And there's no-go theorems for all Gaussian stuff, so you can't take it to an extreme. We can apply quantum information tools out of the box because we have a logical qubit. We have non-Markovian evolution, so this could be fundamentally interesting to model these things, the gauge one sticks around. Several observations, decomposition in Q versus P biases the logical noise to dephasing along Z versus X. So it induces, it introduces bias noise to the description and which, it's, which bias it gets depends on what you choose to do to decompose it, but the physical state's the same. In practice, we would measure P for logical X. So dephasing may be fictitious in practice. This is something that we wanna look at further. So in a sense, what you do is you could look at the same physical state as decomposed in Q or in P, and where it is in the block sphere would change ever so slightly in those two decompositions. Um, square wave binning, where you say, this is zero and this is one and this is zero and this is one, anywhere in there, that's what's used in optics. And this gives the asymmetric performance. It's good along Z and it has this, this you know, dephasing which uh, reduces the fidelity along X. But cosine wave binning is used effectively in circuit QED to extract the logical block vector. I can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, but this ends up, this is equivalent to using the bad axis description along all axes. So that's, that's what they've actually done in, in circuit QED to extract a logical block vector. And part of this talk is to just impose, just get it in your head that this is not the only way to get a logical block vector. GKP's original gate set acts non-trivially on the gauge mode, unless the states are gauge fixed for this. So this gives, I mean, the, the, it, we haven't made the, the connection to subsystem codes like um, David Poulon had, had, had developed um, explicitly in our paper, but this, this is, that's something that we're exploring and this is, this is an important fact. Other simpler states may have the same logical uh, content as GKP. What's the significance of that? And can we get a subsystem decomposition that's egalitarian along all axes? I ran a tad bit long, but thank you all. Hey, thanks, Nicholas, for a very nice talk. Um, I see um, some questions in the Q&A. So the first one I'm seeing here is by Andrew Landau. You described several CV codes in your talk. You also pointed out that some preparations are hard for GKP codes. Magic state preparations are hard for many qubit stabilizer codes and code switching is a way to dodge that cost. Is there a way to use code switching between CV codes to achieve universal FTQC while dodging the technologically hard operations for the various CV encodings? So can well, we that's a fascinating that? question. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. Um, Andrew, we should, we should talk um, offline. That, that's really cool. I think, I mean, you, you can't get something for nothing. So, so the, the, the non-Gaussian resource is going to be the logical zero states. So the, the Pali eigen states. In principle, once you have that, you don't need anything else because Gaussian operations give you the other pieces. I'm not sure how that would shake out though. And I'm quite interested to see that. So, you know, send me an email or, or a message on Slack and let's discuss. Here's another question by Christoph. Uh, are there other interesting choices for the decomposition of the Hilbert space? 
for example, a more mm. symmetrical one with respect to the P and Q noise? I thought about that. So, I mean, that's, that's exactly what this, and maybe that was asked before I showed this, but that is exactly what we would like here. And the, the short answer is I don't know, and we're looking at it. So if you'd like to talk to us about it, um, uh, you know, just send me a message, um, let's discuss it. I do have some ideas. The, the brief answer is that what this corresponds to is a projector based on binning with a square wave. And the Fourier transform of a square wave is not another square wave. It's going to be a sink. And that's another way to interpret, well, sorry, it's going to be superposition of sinks. It's going to be something, uh, is this a cosine? I don't know what it is. Anyway, it's uh, the Fourier transform of a, of a square wave. Um, so when you do that, you, you can't do one for one because Q and P are related by Fourier transform. That being said, there may be more clever ways to do it. And I'd be happy to look into those views. Um, okay, thanks, Nicholas. I have one more question. So do you think this modular description with the gauge system is also explicitly useful for decoding? You know, we've done studies with repeated um, sort of error correction, teen error correction on GKP and, you know, decoding mm. task is not necessarily trivial. So um, do you have thoughts on this? That's a very interesting question. Um, I have not thought about decoding because uh, I mean, the answer is that I could give is probably because there's there's lots of nice intuition that you get here. So, like the the you know the, the qubit decoheres a little bit if your state's not great. Um, if you're trying to take into account the idea that that maybe some of the qubits are a bit dodgy, you know, you make the measurements and you don't trust them, that's that can be captured in this framework. Um, there's a lot of directions that this can go. And I would be happy to talk with you about it. <laughs> I, I don't have any immediate thoughts on it, though. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Um, are there more Thank questions? Um, maybe I can say one more comment. Do you focus more on optics? And I think this yeah. representation and this binning is more natural in optics in the sense that, mm -hmm. you know, the fidelity, if you can do this homodyne measurement and then you're in one or the other bin, right? So this this sort of how to what extent, you know, your logical qubit is a zero is also really what you representing by what you measure. Exactly. Yep. Right. I Whereas agree. in the circuit QED, this like you mentioned, measuring Q, if your mode is sitting in a cavity, it has to be released or it's, and, and typically mm -hmm. you have this qubit, you know, you measure, that's what you say here, maybe this cosine wave binning, which I didn't fully understand. Yeah, it is. Like if you measure the logical Z or something like that via a qubit, that's a different, yeah. is that what you mean with cosine binning or? Yeah, well you're measuring, I, I think as I understand it from talking to um, uh, Krista Blumen, uh, that, that the, the, you're measuring a superposition of the stabilizers. And what happens is that if, if your state, so imagine you have a perfect GKP state, it's been displaced by a little bit. And imagine that that displacement goes all the way to the border of a bin then the expectation value of sigma z in that case becomes zero because the way that the, the measurement works is that is that it becomes off axis so you get a rotation away from what it should from what it should be as as you move that's exactly what happens in the p quadrature here but it's not what happens in the q quadrature so it could i mean the the, the egalitarian perspective could be to, to make the most conservative one where we, where we say we're going to use that approach, this cosine wave binning where there's dephasing along every axis. I don't know how to do that either, but that would be a little closer to what circuit QED is doing. And then you would have the logical qubit just as you do here. Okay, yeah, because it does seem to be that it's also important to tie it to what you actually are able to measure. Um, Absolutely. Experiment, which is of totally course also a moving target sometimes, yeah. Yeah, well, you might end up with just leakage. You know, you have like the logical qubit, and then you've got some other states that aren't in the Hilbert space. So if, if, if it's in those states, then you just say it's leaked, which is kind of what this is doing. You know, you just, you, your leakage becomes deco, uh, because you can always correct uh, leakage just by replacing it with a totally depolarized qubit, as I understand it. So I think that's, that's what's happening there. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Um... This moment. Let's see, let's see, look at the Slack channel. I think there's. Oh, no, okay. 
Okay, I think not. And I think then I'd like to close this section. Thank uh, Nicholas and all the speakers again. Um, so hope to see you all at the next session. And um, well, bye-bye. <laughs>